Thank you very much. Uh, let me start by saying every day across the country and the world, we hear of how many children are being molested and sexually abused by those close to them, those that are meant to protect them. This being either the fathers, the brothers, uncles, neighbors, church elders, and even people in the prominent positions. Families tend to turn a blind eye and rather do what is best for the perpetrator rather than what is best for the victim. This is part of the EFF GPV desk series, the second one, which is hosted by Dr. Susan Tembequayo member of the Central Command Team and GBV Help Desk. Thank you for tuning in. We will be discussing child molestation. It is the goal of the EFF GBV Desk to prevent, engage, educate, strategize, recognize, and report child abuse and neglect. Child abuse is an act that endangers a child's physical, emotional health and or development. Child abuse may take several forms, including physical abuse, which causes physical harm or injury to a child. And it can take place in many forms, and what is important is that we all have to make sure that we are aware of those uh, aspects that are part and parcel of child molestation. All children have the right to live free from emotional, physical, and sexual violence. Violence against children continues to affect every country, every culture, every community, across the world with devastating impact. Childhood exposure to violence victimize children and plays a role in transmitting violence from one generation to the next. Children who grow up in a violent household or community can internalize violent behavior as a way of resolving disputes repeating the pattern against their own children. Beyond that tragic effect on the families, violence against children can also obstruct economic growth in general, all of which can hold a nation back from fully developing. Today, I have got the panelists here some of them are representatives of their NGOs, both dealing with child molestation. Amongst the panelists, I have got those that were there that would speak from the encountered experience. I've got also amongst the panelists, a panelist that will talk on the experience of being an educator and how they experienced the child molestation or maltreatment taking place in school. What will happen right now is I am going to give the panelists a chance just to introduce themselves. And uh, thereafter, we will start with uh, the important matters of the discussion of 
today. I'm not going to mention anything on the statistics that is happening because it's part and parcel of the presentations that we will receive from the panelists. Number one will be uh, Busi Maferega. Busi, this is your turn to introduce yourself. Busi. Okay, well, I'm still waiting for Busi to connect. Can I give um, Faitadi Makato a chance to introduce herself? Morning, everyone. My name is Faita Dimakato Patlam Raswi, the Nkangala Regional Coordinator of Gender Based Violence Desk. Uh, thank you. Can we proceed to Tidi? Tidi, can you introduce yourself? Good morning to all the listeners. My name is Tidi Magidi, National Consultant at EFF GPV Help Desk. Thank you very much. Can we give back to uh, Busi Maferaka to introduce herself? Busi? I think there's a problem on the side of Busi Maferaka. Can I give Komisa Matabelo to introduce herself? Good day, everyone. I'm Mata Pelosiwisa. I'm a member of the Central Command Team and also a member of Parliament, but has been an educator for 14 years uh, across three fields of educate phases, which is the intermediate phase, senior phase, and the equity phase. Uh, thank you very much. Can I give over to uh, Monica Moahi to introduce herself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Monica Moahi. I'm the intervention specialist at TS Foundation. Uh, I've been there since it started. Uh, we've been running the, the help desk with Mara for quite some time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I go back to Busima Ferreka to give her a chance to introduce herself? Good morning, everyone. My name is Busisi Wemafirika. I'm a, a coordinator of gender-based violence under EFF in City Bain region. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Can I give over to Patricia to introduce herself? Good morning, everyone. My name is Patricia Takoli. I'm a social auxiliary worker at an NGO with the name Pitch in Cape Town. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can I give over to Maradleni to introduce herself? Hello, everyone. I'm Maradleni. I'm the founder of Tears. I founded Tears because women need a voice. It doesn't matter what political party you are or what color you are. Rape is rape, and we are against rape. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adlana, uh, Mara, Glenis. Sorry for that. And then I'm going back to give the panelists to talk to us on the matters of child molestation. Uh, number one will be Busi Mafereka, who will be speaking on personal encounter entitled, I am from there. Busi Mafereka, this is an opportunity for you to talk now. Thank you. Busi? Busi? Hello. Okay. Hello, Come. Busi. Can you speak? It's your turn now to talk on the pe your personal encounter. I am from there. Can you hear me, Commissar? Yes, we can. Can can you proceed? Okay. Um, this see. thing happened to me when I was six years by the person whom I thought is my father. 
because he raised me since I was two years. Started to me, I didn't take it seriously. My mom used to always, when he fight with my father, he will go and left me. Then when this thing started, my father just called me. I was sleeping under under the table as we were living in the one room shack. Then he called me, then he asked me to sit on his lap, and which I did. Then he just showed me the magazine of naked people. Then it was like, I was young. Then he said, he said to me, look at this because uh, we are going to do this. Then to me, it was like, Papa, how are we going to do this? Then he said to me, I'm going to show you. Then what he did, he took a Vaseline and this, the last finger. Then he started to put his finger and my, under my private part. Then it was like, but this is painful. This is itchy. Then he said to me, shh, don't worry. You'll get used to it. Then he continued doing that. Then that was the first time when he started doing this. Then I didn't tell anyone, as he told me that if you tell anyone about this issue, did you see how, how, how horrible I am? Did you see me when I was beating your mom? So, because I've seen that, I'm shy. I've seen that, I've seen his capability. Then he said to me, when I'm so shy and so bulal, then I didn't tell anyone. Then he did that again. Now he was doing that using two fingers. Then now I started to pee. Every time when I sleep, I was pee. Then they will beat me. Kamili Zingu will do that to me. Then I was scared to tell anyone about this. The last mm -hmm. time when he did this, I remember when I have to tell my, my cred, ma, he did that by trying to put his, I, that was my first time seeing such a big thing like that. Then he tried to put that in my private part. Then I was saying, no, Papa, Papa, then he said, shh. Then I was screaming because that, I never experienced that pain in my entire life. You know, still like it's yesterday when I'm talking about this. It was very, very painful. Then I screamed and screamed. That day I screamed without even fearing that he might kill me or do whatever to me. I screamed. Then after screaming, while he was trying to shush me because uh, the place that we were living, there were people, the nearby. Then there was, uh, I remember there was a, 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 a woman who said, Busi, what's going on there? Then. She, he opened the door for me. I went straight to my to my mom's parents' place. When I get there, I didn't realize what in his camera, being humble, his camera started. Then my figure, my mom was not there. It was my grandma. Then I told my grandma what happened. What pains me is that by that time I didn't know how did they deal with this situation. But all I knew when I was old is that. They did have a meeting and talked to the person that I thought is my father. And they talked to him and tell him never to do that again. But they didn't do anything about that because after that, the effect is that being is Kamela, then now they are busy with this remedies. They give me harmons and milk and all that stuff. So it took me a while in this Kamela. They don't even want to take me to the clinic. I guess they were scared that they were going to be asked why this Kamela. It wasn't easy for me. to the thing is higher if my mom is not around. I'd rather be at anyone's place, whether you can tell me I'm not going to go there until my mom come and fetch me because now I was scared that this man is going to do this to me again. 
And I can see that my mom was happy with this man, not even understanding what makes this woman happy with this person. So it took me the whole years with that anger. You know, I think I told my mom that I'm, I, I'm angry with you, I told my mom that in 2017, that's when I told my mom that Zonda, Young Zonda, I feel like you never took care of me. You never even fight on my behalf. So, yeah, that's my story. Thank you. Um, th thank, thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Though it's it's a very emotional, texting uh, story uh, for all of us to listen to. But at the same time, it's like I said, it's an indication of the families that tend, that usually turn a blind eye and then on the problem and rather do the best for the perpetrator, which obviously means the parents did not do anything to, 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 to help her, and, uh, uh, which is not good. Whatever form that is taking place, definitely, it's not supposed to be as severe as, as it has been depicted. And then, Busi, can I ask a question, but I can see you are uh, muted there. If it was possible, can I ask the question whether you have gone through psychological help or, or not? And uh, what is it that you need from us to, to help you if you need help? You see? I, 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 Commissar? Yeah. I did went to a psychologist in 20, I think it was 2017, yet I was able to tell my mom how I feel about my mom. But psychologically, so this thing is all about you telling yourself, oh, let it go. But it's the scar that will stay with me for the rest of my life. Knowing what happened to me at the young age, knowing mm. what the thing is Tamela because of whatever that happened to me by that time. So that's the only thing that I always told myself that I won't allow this to happen to my kids, not to any kids in my presence. Okay, and then sorry for the for the last question is how did this impact on your social uh, life? You know, the relationship. Uh, uh, I, 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 I grew up as a tomboy. I never wanted to be a lady. I never wanted to be a girl because all I've seen about the girl is that a girl deserves to be had. So I decide it will be much better if I, I'll be like a man, act like a man, be a tomboy. It took me a while before I realized that who am I? What exactly I am? Because I feel like, okay, I can see that the boys by that time, they were safe. It was not like now that they also been raped. So mm. I feel like it will be much better if I'll behave like a boy, play soccer and do all those things. That's all that I console myself with by that time. Um, child, thank you, Busi. Child abuse is really thank an you, act that endangers a child's three aspects, the physical aspect, the emotional health, and or their development. And it's due to this rape child molestation that causes such a big change into a person's life. I will go now to uh, Dimakato to talk to us on the cases that she has attended to and is busy attending to them. Dima, it's your chance now. Can you talk to us? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Commissar. Our experience this side of Ngangala, we had a case whereby um, a 12-year-old, uh, those girls doing the praise and worship in a church, um one day the pastor after the church he took that child 
like he was close to the family of that little girl. So the mother was not having any problem if the pastor comes and takes the girl to say, uh, today we are going to assist uh, this girl with her maths homework. So it happens that they were not doing that only. Yes, he was assisting the girl with the homeworks, but he was not assisting the homeworks only, but also sexually. So he was buying this uh, girl gifts like um, KFC, the sweets called Ferrero chair and roses. Like he will tell the girl that do not take these roses home. Just, just take them smell them and you are going to feel me fine it it happens severally the girl was not saying anything the girl by the way it it okay uh, i think it was 2018 when this whole thing happened the girl was 12 years by then so the pastor will uh, like during the week will come and take the girl to do the homework and take take the girl to the field in the bushes to go and do uh, to 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 go and abuse her there, and when we found out, is like he bought the phone to the girl so that they can chat. The mother called me because I'm close to the mother. She called me and said, "No, man, I'm like starting to see this and that happening to my child, and she's having a phone that I don't even understand where she got it." I said to her, okay, trap the girl with, uh, with, with the, the sibling, the younger sister, so that you can see if really she is having the phone. Because usually the girl at uh, around half past five, always when she comes back from the homework uh, class with the pastor, she's always tired and she wants to sleep. To sleep. She, was no longer doing, she was no longer eating with the family on the table anymore. To like, I want to eat in the in in the bedroom while after I bath and I sleep. Kanti, she's not even sleeping. She's busy on WhatsApp with that old man called by the name of Pastor. So, fine. One day they went and uh, took off the, the 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 blanket of her face. She was busy on the phone. They took the phone and they sold. They found out that the girl is uh, busy with a uh, Pastor there. The pastor was telling the girl that I love you and I am going to marry you, but only if you are going to pass your matrix. And after that, I am going to marry you. So it happened that the, the mother of the child contacted me again. We went there. I called uh, the, 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 the regional uh, command team to come and assist me with this case. We went there and we found out, we saw the phone we asked the girl, the girl said, no, the pastor is not raping her. She never raped her. They are dating. They are in love. So we were like asking ourselves, how can a 12-year-old say she, she is dating a man? I think the pastor was around 48 or 40 something years by then in 2012. So it happened that uh, we went to the church. We vandalized the church. We went to the police station ourselves to go and force the police to go and arrest that pastor because of what he did is, is, is unbelievable. You cannot tell the 12-year-old that you are dating her, you are in love with her, you actually love her. So the police, yes, they went there, they, they arrested the pastor, but unfortunately he came out on bail. Uh, they charged him with a statutory rape. They called it statutory rape. It's unfortunate that we, as the EFF, we didn't have the gender-based violence help desk by then, mm -hmm. but we also tried a lot to assist the family. And the second mm -hmm. case that we have, again, with another pastor. The pastor grew up in, into this child, two girls family. So the pastor will go to the family and ask the parent to take these two kids to the mall or what. As the uncle, yes, the mother of the kids allowed uh, the, the pastor to take uh, the kids out because the kids would usually call, her, call him uncle. So they will go with uncle to the mall to buy sweets, to watch movies, 
But after all that, pastor will take those kids to his house, his maternal house, and raid them. He was not doing it uh, the way we know it. He was doing it from behind, from the anal. So like to, to maybe from the anal, it was, he was thinking that he's not going to, uh, it won't be traced. So uh, the mother of the kids, he all, she also came and came to the EFF uh, GBV desk and laid a complaint. Then we went to police station. We talked to the uh, uh, station commander there. We explained this. Then at least they acted immediately and went to arrest the pastor. But, they, but after they took those kids to hospital, what amazes us is they went to test the girls and both girls, the results came negative. How? We don't know. Uh, they said they, they, there's no sign of penetration in their anal and they couldn't test them uh, inside their vagina because of the complaints say it is from behind. So mm. uh, that is how the pastor was also released on free bail. Actually, it was not even free bail. These charges were dropped. So yeah, those are the things that we experience this side. And indeed, such things are, are happening to these kids. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Dimash, for the information you shared with us. And uh, this is also an indication of how our EFF GBV desk uh, helps to intervene in helping the families, various families, to get the perpetrators to account for their illness. And in the same way, it's, it's a way to stop GBV in the region, as it was mentioned. Thank you. Uh, the following uh, um, speaker is uh, Tzidi Madidi, who will be speaking on child molestation that happened in one of the neighbors houses. Tidi, this is your chance. Can you speak to us? Thank you. The case I want to speak about is a child that was raped by her uncle. The grandmother of her child spotted her coming from behind the bedrooms with her dress hanging awkwardly. The grandmother asked her what was happening. And the child explained to the grandmother that the uncle put his fingers uh, on the private parts and also his tongue as well. The grandmother telephoned the police who failed to come. As a neighbor, I took my phone and I phoned the station commander who swiftly exercised an arrest. When the uncle was awaiting trial, I communicated with uh, social workers who helped to establish that the child had experienced abuse at the hands of the uncle for a prolonged period of time. And she was now internally damaged. It took a period of three years for the trial to be concluded in a conviction of 15 years. Throughout the three years period, the mother of the child has been victimized by the family and abuse carries on till today. With them saying this should have been solved within the family. Um, telling you, Komisa, the situation is not good at all for the mother and the child. To such an extent, the mother had to take the child to Pumalanga to stay with the relatives because of the verbal abuse from the family. The abuse is worse when the victims are targeted by their own family. What has happened since is a very disturbing as the child has suffered psychologically and physically damage. 
Her teachers at school have reported her inability to keep up with her classmates. And yesterday, I also talked to the child. She is, she needs help, that child, Gomisa, she needs help. For her in order to be okay and perform like other children, she really needs help, Gomisa. The child is struggling to cope. She has gone through verbal abuse, all the abuse she has gone and needs her mother in order to try to heal. As the mother was forced to move the child to Mpomalanga to stay with the relatives because of the abuse. You can imagine, Commissar, the child is internally damaged. And the perpetrator is the uncle who's supposed to, to, to take care and look after the sister's child. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tidi. I just want to ask you uh, uh, one question. Since the child is, is, is uh, your neighbor, uh, what is it that you have noticed on her behavioral pattern before uh, uh, the, the molestation took place and, and now, the behavioral pattern? What is it that you have noticed? Can you talk this about child that? Was, this child was very active, Gomisa. This child was a, 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 a loving, smiling child always. But nowadays the child is struggling to cope and uh, she's no longer playing with her friends. She's forever in the house next to her mom. And uh, uh, she's even scared to go to the loo because the loo is outside the house. She wants the mother to accompany her to the, to the loo. Okay, and the last question, how is the family disagreements on this matter uh, affecting the, the relationship amongst the family members? It affected the family so badly and the mother is no longer talking to the whole family and uh, they took the mother to court that he's abuse, she's abusing them and which is not true. And uh, now the mother is also, she also need help. She, she can't cope, she can't cope, Gomisa. I think we really need to look at this case because it affects the mother and the child so badly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for sharing with us uh, that encounter. Thank you, Tzidi. Uh, the following one will be Commissar Matapelo, who will be talking to us on the experiences that she gained from being an educator by then. Educators are in contact with our children on a daily basis. As such, they are bound to be confronted with children's abuse at some point. Commissar Matapelo, can you speak to us on this issue? Thank you. Uh, thank you, com thank you, Commissar Dr. Susan. Uh, child molestation or child abuse affects the child at academically because you'd find that children become the opposite who they were before anything happens to them. In most cases, you'd find that a child that was outspoken becomes withdrawn in such a manner that they do not participate in class. It affects their books. They don't do work. They feel withdrawn. They, they feel like they are not worthy of anything. They feel withdrawn from their classmates. And most of the time, if a child acts like that, most of the time it's mistaken for being rude or being disrespectful without actually getting to the bottom of the problem as to why is the child acting as the child is acting. And then you get those that are 
more out, that are more less outspoken, which we call introverts. You'd find that the child starts becoming rude, speaks back, doesn't do work, always have an explanation or doesn't have an explanation why they didn't do their work. They prefer staying longer at school than to go home because of the fear that they are going to be, ex to be exposed to what they are actually running away from. And then because their schoolwork is affected negatively, now it's going to affect them even psychologically, it's going to affect them physically in such a manner that they become in their own little world whereby they cannot maneuver around. It becomes a problem. They, they ask themselves, who can I trust? And it becomes difficult for them to focus on their work because most of the time they are focusing on what's going to happen when I leave the school premises. Am I still going to get the monster being at home? What is the monster going to do to me when I get home? And these are people that are always what in their uh, uh, in their environment. These are people that stay with them in their yards. These are their neighbors. These are people that we would find that. The kids trust these people, but these people are betraying their trust at the end of the day. This has a long-term effect on the child. It has a long-term effect, as we've seen with the case of Musi. Now, when I was listening to her, it has a long effect. We only think of now, but we never think of what happens tomorrow. How is this thing going to affect the child? How is this thing going to affect the child when they become adults? How is this thing going to affect this child when they get into a relationship with other kids? How is this thing going to affect the child on the school premises? Is this child going to be able to trust their male educators? Because sometimes, it's not even only the males that are doing this. We get females that are also molesting these kids. And it betrays the trust between the child and the adult. And it becomes a burden to the educators because you don't know what you need to do. You see the child is behaving like this. And most of the time we mistake it to say that the child is being disrespectful, the child is being rude, and most of the time would find that we, we, we take out comments that say, ah, because of in their household, there is no law, there is no values, there are no, there's nothing that's happening, those people are living as they are. But forgetting that at the end of the day, the child, comes to the school, the child spends close to seven hours at the school premises, and we are being sent a child that is very problematic, that is being abused at home, is being sent to school, and when you call the parents in, even the perpetrator comes to those meetings when you call the parents in to say, there's a problem with your kid. Your child is not responding well. Your child is rude. But most of the time you'd find that if we actually sit down and find out what happens, it goes back to the child is being molested, the child is being abused at home. It affects the schoolwork, it affects him academically, it has a long-term effect physically, psychologically, it affects his social life, it, it becomes a long-term thing that cannot only be solved over a, a, a short period of time, because this thing, it's even going to affect them when they leave the school premises, when they become employed, they are going to have trust issues with their colleagues. So this is what happens on the school premises because the child becomes very affected negatively by what is being done to them, whether it's physical or it's sexual or it's verbal it affects the child at the school and it gives educators a very difficult time to actually deal with these things at the school premises. Thank you, Dr. Sue. 
Uh, thank you very much. I just have uh, one question to, to ask and uh, to say, uh, how can uh, schools ensure that children do get assistance in time, in time? Because the time factor of the reporting and everything plays an important role in this issue. Uh, Commissioner Susan, in schools we have, because I'm talking from experience, I worked for 14 years. In schools, we have a problem of teachers are not equipped to deal with this thing. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing that comes there. They are not equipped to do this thing. There's not a rollout that is out there. Mm -hmm. If there is any in-service training like the ones that we receive, they do a selective to say, okay, the life orientation educator must attend that. Right, but what about the other educators? And you'd find in most instances that whereby we need to have social workers on site, whereby if a child comes, we, we find out that there's a behavioral change in behavior of a child. Then we have a social worker on standby on the school premises to make sure that, okay, this child before we started, STD has alluded that this child was behaving like this, but now this child is behaving like this. Okay, there's a social worker on site. Can we refer the child to that? We don't have those resources as educators on the school premises. It takes you as an educator who's dedicated to actually consult social workers to say, you know what, I've got this child. I don't know what's happening. Can you please come and assist? You make an appointment out of your own, you take the child to the social workers because most of the time the parents don't even want to get. And another thing, Dr. Susan, it, sometimes it takes longer for us to pick up who the, which child has got a problem because we are sitting with overcrowded classes and it becomes a problem to actually know your kids to know this child behaves like this, if there's something wrong, I'll be able to pick it up. But now we are sitting with overcrowded classes. We end up only finding out when the damage is already done. Okay. Then we pick up that there's something you'd find out now when there is a smell, when the child starts walking funny, now you want to pick up. But the thing starts with the behavior, the child being withdrawn. Then that's where we are supposed to pick it up. But we can't pick it up because we are sitting with overcrowded classes. We only start to pick it up when we see the physical changes in the child. That's when we, and by that time, already the child is psychologically damaged. Mm -hmm. If I can make an example with Busi's case, whereby it started with a finger. Well, the finger, the child becomes withdrawn. But if we've got less kids in the class, you know your kids, they are, are. something is wrong with Busi. At that moment, you, you, you do your intervention. Because before it can even go to penetration with the penis, you, you, you sit down, Busi, what's going on? Uncle is doing one, two, three, four, five, six to me. Then you can move in before the damage. But because we are sitting with overcrowded classes, we only find out when we see the physical damage that is done to the child. Most of the time, the smell and the walk and the other things that are there. But at that moment, we are, the child is far away. It becomes difficult. As also CD has alluded, it becomes difficult to bring the child back because there'll be scars psychologically, physically, and as teachers, it becomes a problem as to how do we gain, regain this child to be the child that we used to know before this whole thing happened. But the problem is we are sitting with overcrowded classes. We do not have social workers on site to assist us with these problems. Thank you, Dr. So. Uh, thank you very much for the information shared. And we are all in agreement that uh, child abuse is an act that endangers a child's physical, emotional, and or development. 
as a whole. Thank you. Now I'm moving to uh, Mary Glenis, who is the founder of TSNGO and who will be speaking uh, on behalf of the foundation TS. Mary Lane, Lenny, this is your opportunity to speak to us. Thank you. Hello, uh, everybody. I would just like to start off by saying that seemed like a day at the office for us. And I don't mean that trivially. It just means that that is the calls we get every single day. Mm. Heartbreaking calls, calls of people crying out for help, calls of people that don't know where to go. Uh, uh, I just want to tell you that our little foundation, which I started because I'm a survivor, um, helps more rape victims and abuse victims than the Department of Social Development's call center. We help between um, 8,000 and 10,000 people either on our automated line or on our phone per month. I'm just telling you the number of figures. It almost seems unbelievable. And of course, the majority of our callers are from the black community because the majority of people in our country are black. And so it's very important to know that our doors are open for anyone at any time. We offer 24 hour service at any time of the day and night. I just want, Monica's going to cover what, what we do. The, I made a note here just to give you the statistics. Um, if I can, it says um, the statistics that are, are for child abuse is that 60% of abusers are family members, 30% are family and friends, and 10% are strangers. So that tells us we've got to educate our families. We've got to be there for them. And one of the things that we try to do when we do education is we don't talk about private parts, we talk about vaginas. Because the problem is when we get to court, if they talk about it touched my flower, we can't win the case. So one of the important things in fighting gender-based violence is the names. What I also wanted to mention to you is that um, I, I, we've been doing this for almost 10 years, as Monica said, we are a little ebony and ivory team. And we have uh, uh, ladies of every size, shape and color in our office. So that doesn't mean uh, you don't get helped in your own language. And if we can't speak, we'll call you back. But one of the things I also want to mention is that in our country, we lie about the statistics of rape and abuse. Yes, I'm saying we lie. We report them incorrectly. The police don't report the correct figures. The government doesn't report the correct figures. Um, so let's just be saying we, uh, at the beginning of uh, last year, uh, had uh, or started, it's not finished yet, developing a program for recording everything. So number one, um, I would very much like Monica to work with you, please, and see how we can help you so that you can use a similar system. And what I'm saying is my deal with the developers of the system is that once we've got it up and running, I can share it. I'm 70 on my next birthday, I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. And I love Africa. And I want to, this to be still going on when, when I'm toy toying in heaven. So what, 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 so the system is under development. I'd like a, a team from your group to meet with us for, you, for us to show you what we do or, or planning to do. It isn't that easy developing a system, but we've come a far way. The second thing I'd like to offer you is, in order to input the data on the system, we have forms that you fill in when you have, we call them interventions, whether it's your neighbor coming to see you, whether it's the girl in the classroom, whether it's the teachers that you have the outreach to. And we'd like to share our forms with you because I think it's very important that each one of these cases is logged because at the moment it's anecdotal information, let's turn it into hard information. So mm -hmm. from the hard information, it goes into the database and it's recorded. Because if we want to tell the government, hang on guys, you aren't doing a good job, which they are not, um, these are our statistics. I went to the police station and they would not look at her vagina. Hello, 
So you need to get us activists involved, ladies, because I tell you, I would have been screaming at the head of the police or the department or Monica would have or whatever. We have to talk with the big voice. It is unacceptable that our little girls are being abused and their lives will never be the same. They can get better, but they will never get the same. And then the next thing I wanted to say is we trained the gender-based violence call center for the city of Johannesburg on how to answer on calls. Mm. And we would like to work with you on how we would train how calls should be responded on. We'd also like to recommend that Lifeline, um, a Lifeline, uh, I think it's in Norwood, but I also think Pretoria have online training courses that you sign up for because it's very, very important that we bring the people, for me, this is about making sure that people that perpetrate rape and abuse on our beautiful children uh, get to court. And if they get to court, we can't rubbish their house. We can't even get the police to come and let, unless we've made a proper charge and we have information. Because yes, our law in theory protects both sides. But mostly we are a patriarchal society and it protects the men who are perpetuating it. So what we need to do is we need to get the training of all the people that work in your system. I can see your passion. Ladies, I loved your hearts. I felt heartbroken because it's just what we have every day. So our service, um, which Monica is going to explain, we will help you with this stuff. I'm not saying we can always help. But we will help as much as we can because every single girl child in our country counts for us. And, you know, where are we going to be if our girl children are so damaged? In our country, three women, one in three, are raped. Five, uh, four women are murdered every day by their intimate partners. Come on, guys. we got to stop that. It's not good enough. And we just have to hang together. It doesn't matter what our differences of age, size, color, what religion, we have to hang together to make a difference because they're ruining our children and make a stand. So then the very last thing is I wanted to say to you, Busi, please will you forward me your phone number because mm -hmm. I'm going to organize for one of our counselors to see you. And I know you're going to come back on here and say, my life has got better because mm -hmm. I'm a survivor of abuse. And we carry it with us wherever we go. It will never leave me. That's why I found it tears. Uh, that's why I found it tears. But I've learned to live past it. That's a small part of my life now. I can tell you about it without crying because I received healing. And I need you also to get to that place because you were so brave today. Thank you so much. If I was there, I'd break the law and give you a big hug. So from my side, I just want to say, ladies, I embrace each and every one of you. And Monica will answer all the nitty gritty questions. I am absolutely delighted to have the opportunity of sharing with you today, because in our country, if we shared our ideas more and we had more dialogue, we wouldn't have so much fighting. We would have battles won. We would look back in victory that our children can live in freedom. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mara, uh, for giving us in actual fact that the uh, statistics that you shared with us to say 10,000 calls per month. I mean, it's only from one NGOs, NGO. What about the other NGOs and other stakeholders in South Africa that are busy with, with, with the child molestation? How many calls, if we can add them up per day uh, towards building up a, a, a month a, a statistics? Then obviously it, it, it says uh, it goes beyond, you know, unmeasurable uh, in numbers. And uh, secondly, uh, to say, to, to extend, we are very much uh, uh, appreciative to the fact that um, your NGO is extending its hand to inviting us, you know, for, for carrying this burden uh, together. Thank you for that. We, we, we have, we, we started our line that has got a WhatsApp and uh, uh, please call me and the line of email where they can send through the information and CD the one who was talking on behalf of the neighbor's problem, 
is also one of the consultants in, in, in the EFFGBB desk. But we are ready to learn and adapt and share information because they say sharing is caring. And uh, it's very much, much uh, appreciated. I'll talk to the, the DSG, who is the national representative of the EFF GBV desk. And I think she'll also be listening to the splendid uh, information shared with you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next will be uh, Patricia. And then I think Patricia will be able to say, um, Patricia Takoli, who is also a representative from the Patch Heidelberg Child Abuse Center in Cape Town, who will share the information with us. Patricia, feel free to talk Hi. to us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maran. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Susan, for having me. Um, at Patch, we're working with children who have been sexually abused the children who are under 18 years old. And we're getting our referrals from the schools, the clinics, the community, uh, SAPS, and sometimes from the children themselves. Then, unfortunately, only then the social workers will have to assist them and give them therapy. So because of a lot of referrals, then the organization has then decided, okay, we must also have an prevention and awareness programs. So we are doing those programs now at schools, place of safeties, at the crashes, and we're trying by all means to see people where there's a lot of people so we can get as much people as we can to share the information on how to prevent and be aware of child sexual abuse. So when we go to the schools, we focus, especially with the little ones, we spoke, we're focusing more on body awareness because they need to know their bodies and their body parts. And they need to know what is private and the boundaries and what to do if someone is touching them. Mm -hmm. We teach them about appropriate and inappropriate be, be, um, touches and appropriate behaviors as well. So, and we also tell them that nobody is allowed to, to touch them on their private parts, especially not to play because sometimes people make it as a game, like, no, I'm hugging you or, and then let's play this kind of game. So a child needs to know that if you are touching me there, that's a no, no area. You don't touch there. And I'm also not allowed to touch there. So who to tell if these things happen to a child? So if someone touches you, who can you tell? And we always encourage the children that don't only tell your family members, tell other people that you trust as well. It must be someone that is available, someone that is going to listen or someone that is listening to you attentively. That is very important. And you know that someone is going to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So we always say to the kids, Please tell at least five people. We have a safety hand network. That's what we call them. We call it. So we say, tell at least five people that you trust. Mm -hmm. It could be your teacher, your grandma, your mom, or your friend's mother, but not only your, don't put only your family members in. By saying so, we are avoiding that. It could be the father who is a breadwinner or someone that they trust, like a pastor, or someone that is very respected in the community. And then the family is going to try and keep that in the family. Not thinking about the child, the impact of this abuse in the child. So that's why we are always encouraging children that don't only tell your family members. Yes, tell them because you love them and they are your family, but tell someone else as well so that at least one of these people will do something about it because that's what we want. We don't want children after 15 years to still be in that trauma. That's what we are encouraging our children. And also we try 
by going to um, to parents meetings at school. That's those are our targets because we find out that if we call a meeting in the community and asking parents to come to the community halls and it's going to be social workers talking about abuse, they don't really come. So, but if it's a parents meeting at the schools, most people will be there and then we share the messages. We speak to the parents about what to do when they suspect that there is an abuse, what do they need to do? And also we encourage them to report within 72 hours after the incident has happened. But they can also report if it, it, it happened three years or 15 mm -hmm. years ago, or as long the child is still under 18. They can mm -hmm. come to us and still report because that child still need therapy. Mm -hmm. So, but they need to report within 72 hours if the child was recently sexually abused. Then the doctor will then examine the child, do all the necessary examinations and test. And then the assessor will assess the child. After that, the, 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 that social worker will also compile a report for the court and an impact report. And if the, because the child maybe is still too young or like 12 years old, the social worker will write a report um, recommending that this child must go to an intermediary room where she's going to be only with one person, not to see the perpetrator or all other people in the court. So that's what we are basically doing at, mm -hmm. at our organization. Mm -hmm. And we are also working with the, so, um, with the police from F FCS unit. They are very helpful because they are the ones who are investigating the cases of sexual abuse. Mm. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the information shared. And uh, you know what, unfortunately, we couldn't get the police coming on board. All of them, all the police that we approached in general were afraid. Immediately when we mentioned EFF, they said, no, 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 we can't come on board. No, we can't come. Only to find that it's not about them. It's about their work that they are doing pertaining to, to, to child molestation because all the cases are reported to the police. But unfortunately, they refuse to come on, on, on board. But because you are saying they are good uh, and they are helpful, from your own experience, we will take uh, your word and, and, and move with it. And uh, I hope you'll also um, accommodate us, especially when it comes to the report writing or any other things that we need uh, you uh, to help us with. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we are moving to the last um, lady who will be speaking to us, uh, Monica Moahi who will also be speaking on behalf of TS. And now we know exactly why the naming TS and where it comes from. Sis Monica, it's your chance. Can you speak to us now? Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. And good morning to everyone. It's just a pleasure to be here this morning. And we thank God for this day. Um, with TS, it's a name that says transformation, educating about rape and, and sexual abuse. So it's an acronym. We use it, but we teach about sexual abuse. As we know that we've got different kinds of abuse. Mm -hmm. And the most important one that we are facing is gender-based violence. It's been there, but now there is a hype since the lockdown. And we understand why. You know, we can name everything Mara has talked about them, and we understand that rape doesn't have color, age, or religion. It always be there. And we start with patriarchy. Think about it, ladies. I hear, um, who was that, Lucy talking about her personal experience. 
It's all about patriarchy. The mother running away from responsibility. Those are the things that we deal with them daily. And we've got cases that are touching uncles, mothers, you know, uh, fathers who are abusing these kids. What do we do as, as, the, as the family? We protect them. They are the breadwinners. We don't want to shame and name them. And as mother has already said that, we need to identify. Let's not be afraid to call a vagina a vagina. Cases have been withdrawn out of, of roles because of not naming the correct weight. We need to teach our kids all that. Patricia, you've touched on a very good aspect of awareness and prevention. Behavioral and inappropriate uh, behavior. Safety hand networks. Children need to talk, but because they have been threatened, that's another aspect of a threat. When a child has been threatened, they are afraid to say anything. You cannot say what you want to say because you are afraid that you, you lose your mother or your parents. The mothers, they run away from their responsibility like Busi. It was her responsibility to satisfy the husband, but because of uh, that responsibility was too much, give it to somebody else. The child will carry it. Now, what about the stigma? It's carrying on through lifetime. Busi changed. Busi, you know, didn't want to be who she is. She tried to overcome the fear by behaving in the inappropriate, not inappropriately, but differently. It needs to be changed from the core because we've got a core. The core is what do we teach our kids? That's the main thing. Our kids need to be taught correctly from schools. I heard also with our teacher, Matabelo, saying the teachers are there, but they cannot identify. Yes, they can't identify. They're not trained. And the school, that's where you identify these kids. These kids, they've got a burden that they're carrying. We're living in a, in a very difficult society right now where we, we carry responsibility. Remember when it started in 1990 with HIV and AIDS, we had a child-headed families. And those kids were, were, were just traumatized. So it's been carrying on. And that led to kids being... Uh, responsible for their own life. Now we've got the gender each other. We've got our platform, as Mara said, TS is developing some database that we'll be able to share with you guys and assist where we can. Logging the course. The, the, our, our statistics is very poorly uh, maintained. Our gender-based violence, they cannot give us, you know, I even have to fight with the manager of, of national uh, department to say to them, we need this statistic so that we can see where you're lacking. You can receive all this course, but how many are they that can be produced to be GBV? Because in each and in a call center, each and every calls comes in. And we don't, if at tears, we don't assist uh, children only, but every man women, children, and LGBTIQ, you can talk about them. We assist them and we refer them. You know, our referral systems, as Mara said, I will be talking about what we do. We've got a star 134, star 7355. That's our helpline, USSD number, where you can report a case and we'll assist you within 24 hours. We'll take you through from the first step till to the last step. Last step. We go with you from opening up a case at the police station Yes, uh, uh, who's the other lady? Patricia, you said we're working very close with the FCS. We are working very close. And you, I can tell you right now, Dr. Susan, that the police, the FCS, if you engage them properly, they will assist you. They work close. Yes, they are afraid to say, uh, let me come and tell you about what we do. Are they supporting ANC or EFF? We, we, we differentiate ourselves with that. That's a community that we are living in. We differentiate ourselves with what we support and what we are getting our meals from. Instead of identifying the aspect of GBV and say, how are we going to 
to, to, to assist everybody and moving forward. The responsibility, we don't, take, we don't want to take the responsibility of each and everything that we do. Yes, um, Matabelo, you said the teachers are there, but they don't want to also to be responsible and going to, get to court and saying, I've experienced this on this day. Because this should come, you know, as a, as a as a as a takeover to the court and reporting, you know, as a statement to say, I've seen this from the beginning, and you come this year after 15 years. Those are the things that we need to teach our our teachers to say, report while it's still hot. You, you know, you strike the iron while it's still hot. That's where we start. And then also the dedication. How dedicated are they, these teachers? Can they identify? Overcrowding, you've said it about it. They cannot. I mean, just mere assisting one lady at a time that we got get calls, it's, it, it will be a baggage because to get to the call, it will take time. And with our social workers, there are those who are dedicated, there are those who will take time, there are those who will drag their feet. But we're not saying putting everything, everybody in one basket and say they are all corrupt. No, there are those ones who are dedicated. I'm the dedicated one. I can tell you right now. When it needs to, for me to go into that fan and go and collect the perpetrator, I do it with pleasure because I don't want to see anybody leaving the experience that I've left. You know, when Busi was talking, he was breaking down. I think Mara said that we can assist Busi and we really need to assist Busi because when you talk about the abuse, you don't have to relive the, the situation, but to move on. Be brave. I am from the abusive relationships. I am from the background where, you know, abuse was a core because of the uncles, of the stepfather. And it's like you attract these people. They move with you from one place to another. So those are the things that we need to break. And tears is here, as we were saying to you, we are here walking the journey with you from the first step till the last stage to, to open up a protection order. Yes, they will say the protection order is a, just a piece of paper. But we'll say it to you, enforce it, then see miracles happening. And if it's, it, it hasn't been informed, enforced, call me. I'll call the, the super, the whoever. I'm saying whoever, I mean the, the head. I'll call them and ask them, why wasn't it enforced? Because this person has got a protection. This is a case number. Because if you take it without the case number, that's another issue. We need to open up these cases. Advise our women at schools, uh, who's that, Patricia, to say to them, they should open up case, how big or small, they should have that thing, even if they don't want to report it. But in future, where they attend counseling, they need to say, yes, I did. And then we can go to the archives and bring up the evidence. You know, Dr. Seuss, as, as Mara and, and Tears, we are saying to you, we are here to assist you with whatever you need as an EFF, we are here, we've been trying, we've been sitting on meetings, talking this, you know, we've been having so many talk shops and the talk shops, we've, we know about the trade of reference. We know about the, the, the DV uh, legislatures. We've bought those in books, but the implementation of it, we need to implement. We, have t we are tired of talking, sitting on this meeting and saying to people, we can do this and that. After you have, you have, you have developed such a structure that is working, they don't deliver. They duck and dive around those, those issues. We need to be clear and fair and straight to the point. Let's not hide behind some, somebody or something that is not going to work, but let's assist our kids because we are, we are going to move from this future to the next future where we have beautiful things that will be happening with our kids. Let's stop the patriarchy. Let's help, let's stop this culture of pastors coming in and saying and telling us so many things. We are religious people, but let's not enforce them or say to them, they can practice whatever with our kids. Our kids are so precious and we need them for the future. They are the future. We can die tomorrow, but they should be hanging on and carrying this flag. It's a baton that they need to run with. Um, and with all that, we are here as tears, and we've got our pamphlet. We can send it to you. You can see what we do. We can assist you with your awareness, Patricia. As you have said, you've got uh, awareness that are going on. We can come to you and give you a presentation of a clear vision that we do. And we know with an assistant of your 
organization in EFF, I think we can cover so much because we are based in, in Jobe, but we move in the nine provinces. I thank you so much, Dr. Su, and everybody. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your pre uh, uh, presentation. And uh, I, I'm still saying we appreciate your invitation to us for any assistance that we will require. But uh, I just would like to say our stats increase every day, and yet we still have families that want to resolve issues within their families, exposing the children to this uh, uh, horrendous uh, happenings. We learned through listening to the matters experienced on child abuse. We learned through listening from the educator's side of view on child abuse and other related matters. We also learned from the involvement of the NGOs as representatives and others of their experiences. As such, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your splendid participation today. You enabled us to share a light of what victims go through and how we can help them in the ultimate end. And lastly, I would like to say the EFF GBV desk is functioning. We are an SMS away. You can do a please call me. You can also send the email and then we will help you in whatever way possible. Thank you very much. And uh, this brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you everyone. Thank bye you. bye, everyone. Bye. 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 bye.